So what I want to talk about today is uh, covered communication. So for those of you familiar with physical layer security that will have a somewhat you know, familiar feeling to it with a twist. Um, the one thing I should mention is we've talked a lot, and I've, at least over the past few days, we've heard a lot about you know, privacy amplification as one of the uh, key mechanisms to obtain secrecy. And I'm going to kind of advocate something a little bit different. I'm going to talk about a dual mechanism, which is called approximation of output statistics, which I think is a more natural way to look at things when you're trying to do um, secure communication as opposed to secret key generation. All right. All right, so let me start by motivating and describing the problem uh, I want to present today. So very generally, you know, we have to imagine a situation, a uh, wireless situation, Alice uh, is trying to communicate with Bob and there's an adversary. And what's happening is, you know, very, you know, if you talk to people in, in the you know, defense contractors, they, you know, might not believe in anything we do in physical layer security, but one thing they always do is they make sure they engineer an advantage. You know, if you have to communicate with a receiver and try to avoid detection, you're going to be informed your data somewhere. So if you're in such a situation, you know, the, the challenge is, you know, how do you uh, guarantee that whatever you're transmitting is protected? Okay, and so protection can mean many things. Um, I think one of our weaknesses as a community is to not have a standard terminology. So um, I think we tend to talk about the same thing with different words. That's creating confusion. If you go back to, I think, some of the recommendation of one of the, uh, I don't think it's NIST, but one of the organisms that's uh, a committee that's making recommendations to the US government, they have a terminology which is to say, well, you have to worry about low probability of detection and low probability of exploitation. Meaning you have to worry about your signals being detected, so someone being able to realize something is happening, and you have to worry about someone, you know, once it realizes there is information, extracting it and exploiting it, okay? So this talk is going to be about the former. Uh, figuring out how we can code in such a way that we can somehow guarantee that if there's an adversary, and under conditions I will precise, he won't be able to even realize there's communication going on. Okay, so that's the general setting. So let me put that into terms that might be more familiar to uh, information theorists. So we're going to imagine that we have a legitimate transmitter, Alice on the left, who is trying to encode a message W uh, for transmission over a uh, channel. And my channel I'm going to model as a discrete memoryless channel for now, even though it's for simplicity. There's it can extend to the continuous case, if you like, uh, without too much complication. And so the message has to be reliably decoded by a receiver Bob. Uh, unfortunately, when you transmit <coughs> signals over the channel, these signals are detected through another discrete, discrete memoryless channel by an adversary, which I called Willy here. And the goal of Willy is actually to decide whether there's communication going on. And how do you decide if something happens or not? You build a hypothesis test. All right. So. If I want to be a little more specific, I need to introduce a little bit of notation, so please bear with me. So when we talk about you know, not being detected, we're implicitly saying there is a mode of operation that corresponds to no communication. All right? And we don't always do that when we do information theory. Uh, so here I need to do that explicitly. So I'm going to assume that at the input of my channel, there is a symbol. And you can think of it as zero if you want. Okay? Like you have a Gaussian channel. If you don't put any energy, that's zero on your wire. right? Um, that's your default mode of no communication. So that's a symbol, nevertheless. That symbol I call an innocent symbol. That's what the adversary expects when there's no communication going on. <coughs> All right, now, because the channels are noisy, even if you don't put anything at the input of your channel, you're going to have noise at the receiver. So the noise at the receiver, when there's no communication, I'm going to call its distribution P0, whereas for the adversary, it's going to be Q0. All right, so think again if it helps in terms of Gaussian noise, right? There's going to be detection noise. Even there's no transmission, there's still some fluctuation there. Imanchu? So, uh, so you want to assume that there's this innocent symbol, let's say in the Gaussian case? Zero. Is it zero? Yeah, so. Um, that's true, even though, you know, if you have a power constraint, you could still put it on at very low you know, very low. Here I'm saying there's really, in the Gaussian case, it would be zero. All right, zero power. So that, you know, you get a set, you know, I will have an illustration in a second that, that might help. But think of it as zero and that's correct, okay? All right, now, of course, if you want to transmit information 
you need another symbol because you need at least to modulate your data. So I need to assume that there's at least one other symbol I called x1. And in the talk, I will just talk about one other symbol, even though you can generalize to multiple other symbols. And that other symbol, of course, once I use it, so it would be amplitude a as opposed to 0 in the Gaussian case, is going to induce different distributions. So I'm going to call them p1 at the legitimate receiver and q1 at the warden. All right. Now, I need to make a few other assumptions to make the problem non-trivial. One assumption I need to make is I need to say that, um, essentially, let me focus on the second one here. The distribution Q1, which you induce when you communicate symbol X1, is absolutely continuous with respect to distribution Q0. Why? Or what does that mean? It means that the support of Q1, the set of Z, so that Q1 of Z is non-zero, is included in, in the support of Q0. If that were not the case, you could not be covered. Because you know, every once in a while, a symbol would be detected. So it makes perfect sense. And of course, you need q1 not equal to q0, because if q1 is equal to q0, you're covered whatever you do. right? So there's nothing to do. So these two assumptions, even though they're technical, and we need them in the proof, they actually make perfect sense. I'm going to make the assumption that it's also true for the main channel. And there you would say, why? And um, you have to accept for now that the reason I'm making that assumption if I don't make it, I actually operate in a different regime for which the results have a different form. So I'll have a slide about this. Um, but for now, assume that's true. Um, again, if you operate on a Gaussian channel, all these assumptions will be satisfied. So they're, they're actually very reasonable. So what is the goal of the warden? Uh, maybe, well, OK, let, let me say one more thing. No, so this, I'm, I've characterized my channels here. Now I need to specify how I'm going to use that channel. right? So to communicate. The following is going to happen. Alice is going to encode a message. And that encoding of the message can be assisted by common randomness shared by the receiver in the form of a uniformly distributed secret key. Okay, We will characterize how much secret key we need later down the road. And we will even show um, that sometimes we don't need any secret key. And then there's actually a switch here over which I don't put any prior. So that switch doesn't have necessarily a random variable attached to it, which decides whether we're actually transmitting a code word or just transmitting the innocent symbol x0 during the entire duration of the transmission. Okay, So the transmitter can actually decide not to transmit. And the receiver will have to figure out also if there's a transmission or not. Okay, Now the receiver has access to the secret key and has to make a decision based on the channel output and the secret key. Now the, the warden, on the other hand, has to build a statistical test. OK, so for our purpose, hypothesis H0 will be that the observed distribution is going to be the nth product distribution Q0, meaning it expects that you know, over n channel uses, you will observe the distribution Q0, meaning there's no communication. Hypothesis H1, well, actually, there is communication. All right. So one thing you should note implicitly when I say that, so let me make it explicit, the fact that I'm building my hypothesis like this assumes that the attacker is able to construct Q hat, which is saying that it actually knows which coding scheme we're using. So we're not hiding how we communicate from the warden. The code that we would be using if we were to communicate is public knowledge. So said differently, what we're trying to do here is we're in the following situation. You know, I may or may not communicate with Alex. If I were to communicate with Alex, I would do it using that specific code. I'm telling you which code I would be using. But now, based on knowing which code I would be using and your channel output observation, you have to decide whether that really happened or not. Does that make sense? All right. Is each one a composite hypothesis? It's a, it's a simple hypothesis it's test. Simple. Absolutely. But you have the knowledge of the code book I would be using. You know that, so I'm going to assume my messages are uniform here. So you know the messages are uniform. So I'm not hiding anything from here. Okay. So I'll get back to that in a second. So you know, what are we really doing here? And I have one more slide to really explicit that, because that's sometimes a source of confusion. It's a, uh, the, the warden is building a hypothesis test. Okay? A hypothesis test, as Imanshu uh, presented on Wednesday, can be characterized by a probability of type 1 error, false alarm, probability of type 2 error, misdetection. What one can show is that for any hypothesis test, the performance of that test is going to be constrained by the sum of these two probabilities has to be greater than 1 minus the square root of the divergence between q0n, which is the distribution for h0, 
and Q at hand the distribution for H1. The reason there is D is because I'm using Pinsker somewhere. Okay? The, what statisticians might be familiar with is 1 minus the statistical distance. The reason I'm using D is because D is much more natural to work with for this specific problem, but V is re or the statistical distance is what would show up naturally. But Pinsker is in the process, so that's fine. Okay, so when I talk about covered communication, I'm actually talking about designing a coding scheme for which I would make that quantity small. Okay, so when I say covered communication, that's really what I mean. I'm going to design a coding scheme which is such that the divergence between the distribution induced by my coding scheme at the adversary's output and the innocent distribution Q0n is very small. That make sense? Now, why does it make sense? So, what are we guaranteeing? What we're guaranteeing is that any statistical uh, hypothesis test built by the warden can be no better than a dumb statistical test. All right? The trade-off alpha plus beta equal one can be achieved by a completely blind statistical test that's not even looking at the channel output. All right, so if you want to operate at that corner point here, you know, it's a corner point where the probability of false alarm is one, probability of misdetection is zero, you just always claim that I'm communicating, right? So my whole point is that this, I'm not gonna prevent you from, from saying I'm communicating, I'm gonna prevent you from proving I'm communicating. Are we agreeing on that? All right. And so because of that you know, conceptual view of what we're doing here, I think Sid called this deniability. Essentially, if I operate in a regime where your test has a performance of this yellow diagonal curve, I can deny I communicate it because you can prove it with a meaningful statistical test. Now I can prevent you from saying I'm communicating, okay? So what we're doing, our goal here is that we're gonna design a coding scheme so that you know, if we have a bad scheme, the uh, test might have a performance given by that curve. And by the way, people uh, are usually plotting ROC curves, which are one minus beta versus alpha. So you might be used to flipped curves, but you know, the performance of a bad code might be this black curve. What I'm trying to do is I'm gonna try to squeeze that black curve and make it really close to that yellow curve. So Say that again? Decision I'm looking at the entire decision region. If I make this small, it's really saying that whatever test you build has to be confined to a very narrow region around that line. And then you can choose where you operate. That's my point. You know, I'm not preventing you from choosing where you operate. Prakash? Q0 is fixed, right? Q0 is fixed, known to everyone. Yes, absolutely. So Q at is a distribution induced at the channel output by my coding scheme. And I will have an expression for that explicitly, but I think you have the right idea. All right, so that's what we're trying to do. Um, so to be fair, um, even though I get the privilege of talking about this, uh, there are many people in that room who've done some great work. Uh, Sid is one of them. Li Gong is not here. I don't, I don't think so. Um, so why are people look? Uh, why are, am I looking at this? I should say. Um, I think you know, for all practical purposes, there is definitely a growing concern from, for privacy. All right, so um, it's a very relevant topic. Uh, from a communication perspective, it's something that's been in the air for a while and there's been a renewed interest after the work of people from UMass, uh, Bulat Bash and uh, his advisors and collaborators, who've essentially showed that there is what they call a uh, square root law, meaning if you're using the channel n times, there's no hope of being covered if you're transmitting more than square root of n bits. And the very high level intuition behind that is that um, you have to hide in the statistical noise. You know, you're trying to escape detection with any statistical test. You know, if you think about the variance or the, the, yeah, the, 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 the square, uh, the standard deviation behind your statistical test, it's going to be in square root of n. Uh, so you're going to be limited by that. That's a general intuition, okay? Um, and so after following this, uh, there's been a lot of follow-up work, uh, some of it by myself, but a lot uh, by others, trying to understand that uh, result a bit better trying to understand you know, how much was it dependent on the model that was presented. So can we beat the square root law under certain circumstances by changing the, the model? Can we actually characterize exactly what's behind that big O? Uh, what happens if you, know, you assume you, you're not synchronized anymore? Uh, and there's a very nice paper that I should mention because that's rare enough in our community. They actually managed to publish a, a paper implementing that in quantum optics and they got a nature communications paper. Uh, so information theory study <coughs> nature paper is rare enough to be mentioned, I think. Um, and so there, I'll mention some of these extensions, uh, a bit biased towards my, my own work. 
I'll try to do full justice to everyone and point out to other papers. All right, so let me go back. To, oh, sorry, Prakash. Um, not really. So uh, my next slide is exactly about this. Trying to, but so let me discuss and then feel free to interject. So th of course, you know the natural question. I'm glad Prakas jumped on it. You know, are we trivializing the problem, or you know, does the formalization of the problem make sense? So let's try to revisit a little bit what we're doing. So um, number one, so we potentially allow a secret key. So that's a way of generating an advantage between Alice and Bob. Um, so yeah, I mean, yes, here we're creating an advantage. What we'll see is that in a way similar to the wiretap channel, under certain conditions, we won't need that secret key, okay? But yeah, there's an advantage there. What's very important is that we're, um, so I'll put a little warning sign here because that's something we might want to remove. But the one thing we're not doing, um, we're not, we're assuming that everyone is synchronized in the sense that I'm gonna start at time T0 I'm going to communicate over n channel uses, and everyone knows that, including the adversary. So in a sense, we're not trying to hide a needle in a haystack by forcing the adversary to detect a communication of five milliseconds in 24 hours. He actually knows where to look for the data. So that's good in a sense, okay? Um, we actually assume that really the adversary knows exactly the coding scheme that we're, that we're developing, meaning it could build a hypothesis test knowing that distribution Q hat induced by the coding scheme. All right, so if we hide that, of course, we could make it harder for him, but here we're giving him that information, so that's good. We're making it quite powerful. Um, the other assumption that we're making is that really perfectly knows its own channel. All right, so that's good. Maybe that's not so good. What's not so good and that I forgot to write is that we assume that Alice also knows these two channels. Okay, so there is channel knowledge behind that. Uh, so what could we improve? Uh, well, definitely, one thing we could do, and I'll do that a little bit, because that's not too hard, we can essentially remove the synchronization assumption. What if instead of saying we communicate in a transmission window that starts and stops at predicted times, what if we hide that in a bigger window? And we'll see there's a little bit of, of a gain. Have a question, Sid? the scaling could change. Yeah. So, yes, so uh, Sid is making a very valid point. Uh, lifting the assumptions f about knowledge for uh, the legitimate parties and for the eavesdropper has very different consequences. So and unfortunately, I, I won't touch on that too much, but Sid has done some uh, actually very fundamental work about it. And essentially, if really doesn't really know its channel perfectly, that whole square root n law goes away. Okay, and now, you know, you can endlessly go about, you know, what does it mean not knowing the channel perfectly, but they have actually a pretty nice characterization of what it, what it means. And yeah. here, just to make sure, there are these two separate channels. Yes. That y and Z are they correlated, or there is like independent uh, transmission from X to Y and a completely independent transmission from X to Z? So you could actually make them correlated by putting everything in one box if you wanted to. Okay, you could even make them identical. <coughs> okay, so there's an extreme regime where you could say actually Y is equal to Z. Um, we can analyze that, except in that case, you will definitely need the key to get an advantage. So what we will see is that the size of the key is directly related to the advantage, but the advantage only depends on the, uh, these channels individually, not on their uh, correlation. And it's a one-shot game, right? It's a one-shot game, so one thing you could legitimately argue is I'm only going to prove that it works for one time. What if I compose it multiple times? Um, okay, good. that's good. But that, the, yes? Uh, and and uh, this square then also vanishes when, when uh, P1 is not absolute continuous to P0, no? Yes, so, yes, so, yeah, that's the, one of the assumptions I made. If suddenly P1 is not absolutely continuous to P0, the square root of n goes away. It becomes the square root n log n. All right, so I wanted to rule that out. I'll talk about it at the end because it's kind of a pathological setting. Um, if you try to use that over a Gaussian channel, that's not going to be the case. So there are going to be weird things. You know, we're not going to have a rate, all right? So there's, this, everything I'm going to do here is zero rate. <coughs> but we're characterizing, you know, you know, 
the amount of information is not zero. It's going to behave like square root of n. But because we are in this zero rate regime, there are weird things happening. All right? So for instance, think about the entropy of a Bernoulli p random variable, where p is 1 over square root of n. Entropy is not 1 over square root of n. right? There's a log n that shows up. So because of that, there, are, there could be weird things happening in this regime. And, but I think that's what makes these problems interesting. They are surprising. There are surprises sometimes. So, okay. Absolutely. So OK, so let, let me clarify the parameters once and for all. So n is a number of channel users. So I have a message w, which takes capital M different values, which I encode into n channel users. All right. OK, so I think that's what, what you were saying, the one-shot thing. So I'm going to use the channel n times, and I'm assuming I have a product distribution. Now, that being said, um, the analysis could be performed in a pure one-shot setting. And actually, that's how we get the results. We first have a pure one-shot, and we go to the ID setting to get a nice uh, expression. But the analysis carries over in the one-shot regime. Anything else? The, uh, can a random you're using it to the ith time you're using the channel. Can you use it uh, as part of the encoding? So um, w w I'm not sure I fully understand yeah, your question. Does the encoder know that right now she's encoding for the 17th time? That's 16th time before she's encoded, now she's doing something. So are you talking about, so you know, one message is encoded over n symbols. So is yeah. the i referring to i yeah. within yeah. n? Yeah. OK, so it's a one-shot encoding, right? So it's, 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 non, uh, it's a non-causal encoder, right? So, so I'm, it means that for one message, message one, I'm generating n symbols at once. Yes. Oh, okay. So there's no real-time thing, if you think about it. Uh, but how many, how many variables do I have? How many times do I sample? Uh, is x sampled? n times or once? So x is of length n. So it's a, is of length n. But I use it once. All right. Now, of course, you could compose that model many, many times. So that's why I was a little confused. Okay, so n is the number of symbols in the... To encode one message. In the message, and there is one x, one y, one z. Absolutely. So, can you just say something again uh, about the non-communication symbol? Is x zero? Is there something fixed? Uh, x, so is part of this x zero is part of your channel model, right? Okay. So, so imagine you have a wire. The wire, you know, zero means you're putting zero voltage at the input of your wire. Right, we need to define the mode of no communication. X zero is not, it, it's a symbol, it's fixed. Okay, so X, capital X is my code word. X zero is the default symbol that means I'm not communicating. But uh, Z is, uh, in case you send X zero, Z doesn't get perfect information. Exactly, so there is noise embedded in that channel. This is a transition probability. This is a conditional distribution, absolutely. Are we okay with the model? Any other questions? Sid? Just again, you said that you can compose the scheme many times, but why don't you be careful here? Because the, so, so it's a bearing, the regime, right? Square root of n bits and n channel users. If you just repeat it, let's say, n times, then you will be getting more than the square root of n squared number of bits, which is not possible. So, so exactly. So the composite, you have to be careful. When I say you can compose it, it means you could reuse the scheme multiple times, but then you're you, you're more likely to be detected. Does that make sense? All right, so you know, the, the way to think about it is, you know, if you think about being covered, fundamentally, I think it has to be a one-shot thing, right? Because the more you communicate, you can, you can only help someone detect you, right? So we are analyzing this one-shot thing, and you know, if I, we haven't, I haven't formulated the problem in continuous time, but the reality is you should say, okay, I have a window transmission of length, you know, two minutes, which is somewhere, and that's what I'm going to use to communicate, and I want to hide that. Now, of course, if I use these two minutes too often, uh, you know, it gives power to the adversary. So I, I'm, I'm, all my results are going to be for that one-shot use. So in general, if you have, so you say your statistical distance is epsilon, right? So if epsilon is very small, and then your rows are steep times epsilon. OK, then, then, then exactly. So I, I, we can get away with some of that, okay. right? Because, so, because the, you know, we'll, we'll show that the divergence doesn't, you know, it's going to decay, right? So we can. You know, if we use it multiple times, it's additive typically. So if we choose the interplay between the parameters carefully, it's still going to work. But one has to be very careful. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so what are the objectives of my talk today? So, I mean, I want to show you that we can solve that problem and come up with a concrete answer. But really, beneath you know, the, the, the results that we have, which are you know, nice looking, um, there's really something quite fundamental, which is the idea that there's a fundamental coding mechanism that we have to put in place to stay covered. And that fundamental coding mechanism is related to something we know in information theory as uh, the approximation of output statistics. Okay, it's something that we studied um, in the 70s and in the 90s for completely independent reasons, but that, find a, that finds a very concrete operational significance in the context of physical layer security in general. And I will try to argue that it's sort of the dual of privacy amplification. Okay, dual means nothing, right? So I can use that word, but I'll try to convince you that it's sometimes useful to think about obtaining secrecy through that mechanism as opposed to through privacy amplification. Okay, so if you were at Stefano's talk, right, so his con code construction is based on invertible extractors. There is some privacy amplification behind, but my point is that what's actually happening on the channel is something related to approximation of output statistics. All right, so, um, you know, let, let's try to develop some intuition as to how we're going to do that, right? So what I'm plotting here are two graphs. On the first graph, I'm going to plot waveforms as a function of t, and these are just illustrations. You know, I'm not doing anything rigorous here. And on the lower graph, I'm going to plot the uh, histogram observed by the adversary. Okay, so if you don't transmit anything, all right, you send the symbol x0, this is what the distribution q0 would look like. Now, of course, if you start sending symbol x1, you would be on a Gaussian channel, that's the intuition here, you would be shifting the mean, right? Um, now, of course, when you want to build a statistical test, your, the power of your test will depend on how close these two distributions will be. And unfortunately, if you send the symbol x1 too many times when you modulate, you're going to get a mixture at the output, and of course, you're going to have two bumps, but you'll be able to tell them apart, right? You'll be able to tell there are two bumps, and most likely someone is communicating. So what's the way you can escape detection? Well you have to communicate in a very sporadic way. You, know, you, have to, you can use x1 maybe, but really not too often, because then your mixture is going to be very close to the distribution q0. All right, and that's really the intuition behind it. Now, what you have to optimize are the coefficients of that mixture. Okay, so that's the intuition behind it. It's quite simple, actually. So let's try to formalize that. Okay, so I'm not talking about any coding scheme at that point. I'm just talking about stochastic processes that would be hard to distinguish. All right, so uh, I need to be a bit formal. So let me define alpha n as a quantity which is essentially 1 over square root of n, but actually going to 0 a little bit faster than 1 over square root of n. Okay? Uh, but it's going to 0 like omega n over square root of n, so omega n goes to 0, but omega n times square root of n goes to infinity. That's going to be important for reasons I will explain later. You want to think about alpha n as you know, the probability of me sending x1 through my channel. Okay, so if I use my channel n times, you know, I've, you know I, I choose to transmit x0 or x1 with probability alpha n, how many x1 symbols do you expect? Well, essentially omega n times square root of n. All right, so the conditions I have are saying, yeah, of course, you know, the fraction of symbol x1 is vanishing, but the total number of symbol x1 is still growing with n. Why is that important? Because the amount of information we will transmit will be that omega n square root of n. Okay, so but at that point I'm just flipping coins according to that very biased probability. So my Bernoulli alpha n uh, distribution I call it pi alpha n. Now if you s send that Bernoulli process in your channel, of course at the output of the channels you're going to get mixtures of, you know, p0 and p1 and q0, q1 respectively with weight alpha n and one minus alpha n. Now the cool thing is, if you imagine looking at this over n times using product distributions. The divergence between the mixtures used n times and the Q0 distribution, which is our reference distribution n times, with divergence, what's nice is just n times the individual divergence since everything is ID. And this quantity, we can control quite tightly. Okay, we can show that essentially to the first order, it behaves like alpha n squared over two times a constant. Okay, so conveniently, if you look at the first uh, order coefficient, it's related to the chi-square distribution between Q1 and Q0, so it's a measure of how closely related Q1 and Q0 are. This is something that shows up in many statistical tests. Okay? Now, 
if you look at the amount of information you convey, and so at that point, again, there's no connection with coding. I'm just talking about computing a mutual information between the input, when the input is drawn according to that biased Bernoulli process and the channel output, to the first order, it's alpha n. Okay, and the first order coefficient is the divergence between Q1 and Q0. So again, it's kind of natural, right? And we're saying if Q1 and Q, uh, Q0 are very uh, different, you know, I have a lot of information transfer. If they're very close, there's almost no information transfer. Imanchu? Chi2 is? Uh, it's a chi-squared distance. No, so the only reason I bring it is because if you do if you compute that divergence, this is the coefficient of alpha n squared, which is the first order term in the expansion. As a, if you do a Taylor series as a function of alpha n squared, that's what shows up. All right, so divergence behaves like a chi-square distance, really. All right? All right, so what am I proving here? What I'm proving here is that there exists a process Q alpha n. You know, remember, alpha n squared goes to zero like omega n squared. Uh, sorry, alpha n is omega n over square root of n. So uh, alpha n squared is going to be omega n squared over n. So if you multiply by n, because omega n squared goes to 0, this quantity will still go to 0. All right? So what I have here is I've exhibited an example of a stochastic process, ID stochastic process, which is not Q0, but that's close to Q0. What's the advantage of that process over Q0? Well, that process Q alpha n contains, allows you to use a few symbols x1. So if I were to design a, a coded scheme and still be covered, well, it's going to be much easier for me to show that it's inducing a distribution which is close to Q alpha n than showing that it has a distribution close to Q0. Because if I communicate, I have to use x1. So me trying to prove that I simulate Q0, that's going to be complicated. But me trying to prove that I can approximate that process Q alpha and n turns out to be much easier conceptually. Because Q alpha and n allows me, by definition, to transmit a few symbols x1. That makes sense? So conceptually, that's all there is to it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to design a communication scheme that simulates at the eavesdropper's output the, processes, the, pro the stochastic process Q alpha n as opposed to Q0, but then I know that if I tweak my alpha n properly, I know that that quantity goes to zero, so I will simulate Q0 as well. Is that clear for everyone? So why would I think of doing this? Well, it turns out that there is that mechanism in information theory called approximation of output statistics, which is meant to do that. All right, so let's forget about covered communication for two minutes, and let's go over what uh, output approximation of output statistics are. Imagine the following. I give you a channel, wz given x. I give you an ID process at the input. Of course, at the output, you're going to generate another ID process with statistics that you can compute if you know the transition probability and uh, input distribution pi. And now you're asking the following question. Instead of obtaining that output random variable z with that input process, can I replace that input process by a coded scheme? And by a coded scheme, I mean a code book containing code words xi, which you can number from 1 to m, and you're just going to choose them uniformly at random. And when you look at the input distribution, it's nothing, more, nothing like the original ID process, because now it's, uh, you, know, you have a few mass, uh, mass points put exactly on where the code words are. All right? So your input distribution now, which is not ID anymore, you're putting a mass point 1 over m on the code words xi, which form your code book. You send that through the channel, but of course the channel introduces noise, so it mixes things a little bit. And your hope is that the output distribution, so I think that's what you were referring to Prakash now, the output distribution is a mixture of the distribution induced by every code word. You would hope that this can be made close to the ID distribution originally. How close? Let's say close in KL divergence. What can be proved? And there are many versions of that result, uh, some of them by Masahito here. Uh, but it can be you know, traced back in some very weak sense to the work of Viner in the 70s. You can show that if you choose a number of code, or the rate of your code, so the log of the number of code words divided by the code word length n, to be greater than the mutual information between x and z, then that's possible. There exists a code book that will achieve just that. OK, so you can think of that as a dual of uh, channel capacity. Channel capacity tells us if we operate at a rate below capacity, we can find a code that's reliable. Here we're saying if we operate above capacity, we can find a code for which the output looks like it's ID. 
Okay? So because I knew that mechanism existed and I had played with it, it's kind of natural to try to do that for covered communication. All right, so once you have that, the actual communication architecture is quite simple. It looks as follows. What we're going to do to be covered is we're going to use a combination of capital K codebooks. Each codebook is meant to be a code, so each encoder decoder pair here individually is meant to be reliable for the main channel. The union of this code forms a super codebook, which is meant to be a channel code to ensure the approximation of the output statistics. What's happening is the choice of which exact encoder pair you're using is going to be indexed by the secret key. All right, so if you combine this, you have to do, of course, a little bit of analysis, which I will skip. I'm happy to talk about it offline, but you can show that the analysis carries over and you get both reliability over the main channel and you're covered because you're inducing a process Q alpha N, which is very close to Q zero. So as N gets larger, harder and harder to detect. Okay, so formally, you get results of the following form. You can prove that if you choose the number the log of the number of messages you try to transmit to be on the order of omega n square root of n, and there's a constant that's the divergence between p1 and p0. If you choose the key to be also on the order of omega n square root of n, but the constant is a difference between q1, q, dq1, q0, and dp1, p0. So that term here cannot be negative, so that goes away if actually your dp1, p0 is larger than dq1, q0, which means your main channel actually is better at distinguishing than your warden's channel. So under these conditions, you don't need a key, but otherwise you need a little bit of key to mix things further. All right? Then under these conditions, well, essentially, your, random, your, code, your code will induce a distribution which is very close to q0. Okay? All right. Now, you know, in information theory, we like capacity, right? But unfortunately here, I mean, actually if I normalize by n, everything goes to zero. So initially I thought, well, maybe we should normalize by square root of n, right? But well, things don't work either. And Li Yong Wang actually realized what we had to do. To, make, to obtain a result that makes sense like capacity, we need to normalize by square root of n times the divergence. Why? Because we are in a situation where there is no strong converse, apparently. If you decide to transmit a little more bits, well, your divergence will increase. If you decide to reduce your divergence, you can, sorry, if you, yeah, if you decide to relax your coverness constraint, you allow the divergence to be a bit bigger, you, you can get more bits through the channel. So you really need to normalize by the divergence if you hope to get a constant. But then it's possible to characterize that constant, which you know, relates to the parameters of the system, so the quality of the two channels through D and chi2 here, and you can show that it's optimal. Okay, so there is the equivalent of capacity, but one has to be very careful in how one defines you know, that optimal constant that we're looking for. And that's 100% you know, Li Gong Wang's insight. That make sense? All right, so there's the equivalent of capacity. The results do look a little bit different, but uh, we can have a full characterization. Now, as I mentioned earlier, yes, Chen? Yes, that's a good point. So I was hiding that. I was about to get to that in a second. Yeah, so it's easier if you assume that you take the expectation of a message is N key. All right? I mean, it's, we are rand randomizing is fine, okay? The, what's questionable is to define the probability of error in that matter too. You know, what we'd like to have is a result that says, we're, you know, is we have an average probability of error over the message, but for every key. Okay, so the results I've shown here, they're also still saying, on average, for a random choice of the key and a random choice of the message, your probability of error is small. You don't seem quite convinced. We need to randomize our message and key. It's, it's important, right? That's the only way we induce the process Q0 that means that we're not detectable. Or Q alpha, sorry. Yes? Okay, so okay, you're making a different argument, which is equally valid, right? So you're saying, you know, why are you telling me that the message is uniform? Why are you assuming the message is uniform, right? I mean, we don't, we might not know, and that's, you know, the kind of argument Stefano was trying to go around, right? 
Um, so here I need that. I need enough entropy in the message because the randomization, the randomness of the message <coughs> helps me simulate the output statistic that I need. So I could relax this assumption somehow, but essentially if I have less entropy in M, I have to compensate that with more entropy in the key, which is maybe, which may be what you want. So what I was trying to say to Sean is that from a, from a decoding perspective, I think it's not satisfying to tell the end user, you know, on average it's going to work fine, but if your key is 0010, then it's not going to work. You know, the user would like to work, would like it to work for every key. Yeah, that's, that's normal in computer science in general, right? Uh, uh, primality test is not going to work for some rare. Th that's area. true. But from a communication system. perspective, you know, we like to, you know, even though we use average error probability most of the time, what end users like is maximum error probability being small. So that's kind of what I'm alluding to. So we got around it, so I was getting there. So w to get the first order statistics, that was enough. But then we wanted to get the second order statistics. And that's where we ran into problems. And so we decided to strengthen it and to say, OK, now let's ask the probability of error to be small for every choice of the key. OK, the key is still random in the encoding scheme, right? So that doesn't change how we, we, we simulate the output of the Warren's channel. But from a decoding perspective, that looked a little more satisfying. And our intuition was like, yeah, let's do that. And unfortunately, it turned out to be much more complicated than we thought. Why? Because you know, when we try to enforce that condition, essentially, we need to remove the bad choices. Right, from the, you know, there are choices of code, code words that are just bad to decode, so we'd like to remove them. The problem is if we remove them, we change the output statistics. And so we had to do a slightly subtle analysis to show that we could make the two work together. The intuition you have, Prakash, is dead on, but making it work was a little more tricky than we initially anticipated. But then we got second order asymptotics for the message, and they're tight. Uh, one thing I'm not claiming is that we solved the problem. We don't have at all the second order asymptotics for the key at that point, and we don't know how to get them yet. All right, but you know, you might recognize it's what you would expect, right? The first term is square root of n, the second term is n to the power one fourth. This is actually a variance, even though it doesn't look like one, but in this weird regime, you know, when you compute a variance, it's e of x squared minus e of x squared, because we are in that funny regime, e of x squared is negligible compared to e of x squared. So if you don't see a variance here, it's actually still true, okay? It, it is a variance to the first order. OK, so we characterize that. Um, OK, maybe just, uh, I don't have too, too much time. I have a few minutes left. How much time do I have left? Five minutes? Uh, 15 minutes. 50, oh, no. oh, I have plenty of things to talk about. So stop me, st no. stop me whenever you want. It's 15 minutes till an hour, so but the nominal time is 15 minutes. OK, so let me take 10 more minutes. OK, perfect. All right. so. Um, are there any questions on the results that we obtained? So we have a quite, you know, not com complete characterization, but, you know, a good partial <laughs> characterization of what's going on. And some of the results are definitely as expected. So what's tricky about proving these results? Yeah, Sean? So the function of row M does not depend on uh, oh, what, what, what are we hiding behind this? Is that what you're asking? What, uh, Oh, oh yes, sorry, you're absolutely right. There's a Q minus one epsilon that's missing. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, there's a Q minus one epsilon that's missing. It should be here in that second term. Absolutely, yeah, sorry about this, I, I forgot it. Um, but what's interesting is you see, you know, the first delta for the coveredness shows up in the first, you know, in the first order term. So it's a bit different from the wiretap channel with, a, you, know, with you know, if you think about delta secrecy and epsilon reliability, they only show up in the second term. Here, delta shows up in the first term because there is no strong converse per se because of that weird regime we're operating in. Okay, yes, I do apologize. So this is wrong, but the paper has the correct answer. Okay? Yeah. All right. So, sorry, could you show in the previous uh, slide, so previous slide gives a first order path. So, sorry, two back. Two back? This is the first order, yes. First order is tight for message and key. Second order, we only have the message. We don't have the key. And the reason is because we need, so 
When you get to first order asymptotics, you can operate in a large deviation regime in your analysis. When you go to second order asymptotics, you're in a central limit theorem regime. And unfortunately, to make it work, we had to be central limit regime for the message, but large deviation for the key. That's why we don't have second order for the key. Maybe I'll take, I mean, I'm more than happy to discuss that offline, but uh, maybe for the sake of the talk, I'll, I'll st st stick to that for now. So uh, the one last thing I wanted to say is, you know, what about that first assumption I made about P1 being absolutely continuous with respect to P0? What if it's not the case? So to make a long story short, we can still derive results, but in that case, one, you never need a key, and two, the scaling is different, as opposed to being square root uh, n, we're square root n log n. Okay, and so because there's this weird thing where suddenly, you know, think about the main channel as being an erasure channel, right? There's that one symbol that's never observed by the eavesdropper or the, the, the warden, and that gives you an advantage that translates into a different scaling. And so that's some of the funny things happening with that model. You know, in many ways it looks like a wiretap channel, but the constraints are different. They force us to operate below the linear regime, so there's no rate, there's zero rate, and some funny things start happening every once in a while. Yes? Oh, absolutely continuous. So if P1 is absolutely continuous with respect to P0, if the support of P1 is included in the support of P0, meaning if P0 is 0, P1 has to be 0. That's what it means. And practically, you know, you know, it was easier to understand from the Warren's perspective. You know, if it's not true for the Warren that Q1 is absolutely continuous with respect to Q0, it means they are symbols that can only be reached when you transmit. So the Warren will get you with probability 1 if Fn is large. But it, you know, for the for the main channel, it was a weird assumption to make. But I made it because otherwise the scaling changes. All right. So let me talk about a few extensions. I'll I'll just mention one, given the time I have left. Um, you know, one of the assumptions I had was that everyone knew when communication started and when communication stopped. But if you think about being covered, right? I mean, if you're helping the warren a lot if you tell him, hey, I'm going to start talking at. Uh, you know, 12 p.m., you know, then try to get me, but, you know, you're helping him a lot. So what if you try to hide in a bigger window? And so we, we, we can try to do that. So now what we're going to say is we're going to say we're still having a transmission window of n symbols. So the code word window doesn't change, but we're going to hide that within a transmission uh, uh, monitoring window, because that's what the warden has to look at, which is much bigger. And that's parameterized by this capital N. All right, now for reasons, you know, capital N will be denote the possible start times. So I need to make the actual window a bit larger by a code word length, okay? But N prime and N are about the same. All right, now what's important to realize is the optimal thing to do if you were to code over capital N symbols would be to use a code word of length capital N so that your scaling would be square root of capital N, all right? So here we're not trying to do that. We're forcing ourselves to operate with a small transmission window, which we hide in a big transmission window. And what we're asking is, can we beat a square root of n law <coughs> by tuning the length of the window capital N? Does that make sense? All right, so in principle, if you're giving me that window, my result says you should use the entire window to be covered to have a scaling of square root of capital N. But we're forcing ourselves to have a small length, window of length small n, and we're trying to tweak the length of the big window to see if we can have a scaling better than square root of small n. So the good thing is, um, this was initiated by the people from UMass, and they have a fairly intricate analysis for the Gaussian case only, which gives a lot of insight as to what the Warren has to do. But that is a bit, you know, very specific using chi-square concentration and so on. Whereas that resolvability perspective that I'm putting forward is saying, well, I mean, you're just changing the channel, but the same principle should work. So what we're going to do is we're going to say now, we can not only randomize you know, the code words that we transmit, but let's randomize the transmission time. So let's choose the start time uniformly at random between 1 and n. Then the distribution that we're going to try to simulate is going to be a distribution which is such that everywhere I'm not transmitting, I have q0 for free. And in that small transmission window, I have q alpha n. All right, so of course, it's, it looks a bit more complicated, but uh, I'm still going to apply the same principle. Let me simulate that distribution. So, you know, the math has to be done, and, you know, after many pages of calculations, uh, we get an upper bound. Uh, you cannot use, by the way, uh, you know, we're, average, we're taking a convex combination of uh, 
of uh, distributions, forget about using the convexity of KL divergence. It's not going to work if you use it. You have to really analyze that, how that distribution behaves more precisely. So that's why it takes a few pages of calculation. We get an upper bound, which is very unwieldy, but we can now choose how to scale the length, the window length capital N with small n to make that quantity go to zero. And so the result we have, let me just focus on examples because it's easier to understand. If we choose the window length, the monitoring window length, to scale a little bit faster than n square over log n, then your effective covered throughput is square root n log n, as opposed to square root n. If you choose the window length to be exponential in n divided by n, then you can get a linear scaling, which is the best you can do if you transmit over n symbols. All right, but of course, now you're hiding a needle in a haystack, right? The monitoring window is much, much bigger than the actual transmission window. So what I should mention in all fairness is what we're doing here is we're improving a little bit on a result by Bulat Bash and his colleagues where they were also looking at asynchronous communication, but they were only using slots. Essentially, you could choose a, a code word transmission in slots, whereas we're unslotted. And we have a small gain. Essentially, their window size, for instance, here would be n squared as opposed to n squared log n. And here would be exponential as opposed to exponential divided by n. So if n is small, you know, I can argue that yeah, we're doing much better. If n is large, there doesn't seem to be a strong advantage to being unslotted as opposed to being slotted. All right, so I think uh, I will wrap up. I will just go quickly over my backup slides. It's possible, of course, you know, once we have the, the tools and we have a good handle of the model, we can say, hey, you know, what if we also want my message to be secret? And then we can have like a wiretap-like setting plus covertness. Uh, we can combine things. And uh, what we can show, for instance, is a result that's very similar to the secret, secrecy capacity of a channel. Essentially, if that channel here is better than this one, we can transmit reliably and covertly without a secret key. And we have an exact characterization of that. Um, I'll skip that. Um, we can also study multi-user models. Um, so what's interesting here is that even though, I'm not sure I should say that, but um, even though we solve the point-to-point -point case, right, and even though it looks like the tools we have to put in place are the, you know, pretty similar to the one we used for the non-covered case, it's not so easy to go back to, to go to multi-user settings. Why? Because the achievability is pretty clear. You have to check that it goes through, but the converse needs some care because the conversers are going to be different because you're not in that linear regime. And so this is the capacity of a multiple access channel when you're covered, for instance. You know, what's, the first thing that should be striking is that there are only two constraints. There's no sum rate constraint. You're not limited by what the two users are doing jointly. You only have individual constraints on the, on the two users. And why? The intuition is that you know, every user has to communicate very sparsely, right? And essentially, you almost have never the two users transmitting at the same time. It's either one or the other with our choice of parameters. And so the sum rate constraint goes away asymptotically. OK, so with that, I uh, will conclude. So I think the one thing I'd like to convince you is that looking at that mechanism that you know, approximates output statistics makes a lot of sense in physical layer security, and especially when you analyze secure communication problem. If you do secret key generation, the right thing to do is slip involved plus privacy amplification. There's no doubt about it. But for secure communication problem, it makes a lot more sense to analyze that mechanism because it's much more connected to using a code book, I think. And any you know, proof that would use privacy amplification and information reconciliation would be very indirect in some ways. Okay, now, you know, Stefano's construction is kind of proving me somewhat wrong. I mean, it, it, I'm not saying the two are incompatible, but I think it's still indirect. You know, you, for me, using invertible, you know, the name is invertible extractors in your construction. So this inversion is somewhat, it's weird for coders, you know. Um, and I think that's, that has something to do with this. But one can show, for instance, that your code construction does channel resolvability over binary symmetric channels for an uniform input distribution and a corresponding uniform output distribution. So it's totally compatible. Um, you know, what's nice about that analysis also is, it's a slightly more subtle technical point, that your standard typicality arguments are meant to fail. Okay? Because we are in a regime where the information scales as alpha n, but if you look at the joint entropy between the input and the output, it has a weird regime because the input is heavily biased, the output is not, and if you try to use typicality, you will have a problem. You won't be able to choose the epsilons in the same way for the input and the output. So you have to look at concentration of mutual information directly, which I think is interesting because it says that you know, typicality is not the answer to every problem. 
if you're interested, um, I pointed at references, so one by me, which is mostly what I presented, but there are great tutorials by one by Sid here and one by uh, Bulat Bash that do a great job surveying the results in the area. Uh, and we're actually, I have an undergrad playing with that experimentally. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to use 802.11, and in principle, you're not supposed to use the uh, OFDM tones on the side. So we're just transmitting things on the side and asking people to figure out if we're transmitting information or not. So uh, we're testing that right now. There's a lot of work to be done in the area. So we mentioned that to Alex in coding. There's plenty of cool stuff to do. Um, we, have, we need codes, essentially, that have very low weight. These are good covered codes. And any linear code, yeah, unfortunately, if you look at the weight spectrum, there's a lot of heavy weight. I mean, it's hard to not be linear at some point in N. So, well, let's... I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>